Anyone wishing to provide public comment during public invited to be heard must watch the live stream of the meeting and call in only when I, I or the mayor open the meeting for public comment. Callers are not able to access the meeting at any other time. Watch for the instructions to be displayed and write down the meeting ID when it is displayed at the beginning of the meeting. Wait for I or the mayor or me to open public comment and direct callers to call in. When the mayor or me say to call in, dial the toll-free number, enter the meeting ID, and when asked for your participant ID, press pound. Mute the live stream, and I repeat, mute the live stream and listen for instructions on the phone. Callers will hear confirmation they have entered the meeting, will be told how many others are already participating in the meeting, which includes staff and the city council, and will be placed in a virtual waiting room until admitted into the meeting. Once admitted to the meeting, callers will be called upon by the last three digits of their phone number and allowed to unmute to provide their comments. Comments are limited to three minutes, just like normal public invited to be heard per person, and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with their comments. Once done speaking, callers should hang up. At this time, we will take motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I would like to move to add um, the resolution that the council members received in their email this afternoon to the agenda, the consent agenda for the next regular meeting. Um, and I would like to uh, ask the city clerk because of the ballot mailing timing whether it would be appropriate since next week isn't a regular session um, to uh, suspend the rules so that the council could debate it um, uh, next week anyway. I'll, I'll second the motion the to put this on an agenda. I don't know what to do the rest, with the rest, the rest of the request. I don't right. either, that's why I asked. So we've got a motion, now we can debate it, right? Now we can discuss it, right? Yes, uh, the motion is the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, I believe the proper procedure would be at that meeting to uh, suspend the rules of procedure to make such a, a vote, if you will. At least that's my understanding. If somebody would like to clarify, any um, Eugene, Eugene, Mayor and Council, you could vote at this meeting to make next week's meeting a regular meeting. Otherwise, you could suspend at the time uh, at next week. Uh, you could suspend rule procedures to take a formal action then. Thank you. Thank you, uh, City Attorney May. Uh, as such, let's, I think before we decide on any procedural votes, let's, let's first have uh, any sort of debate on this motion. Uh, Council Member Peck, or I mean Christensen, sorry. Um. I don't really think it's appropriate for us to spend our time debating ballot issues in city council. These are statewide ballot issues and I, I really don't uh, see why we would be debating them. We, we all vote on these and I, I don't see the necessity of spending our time and the public's time debating state ballot issues. Councilmember Martin. Um, I find that a surprising attitude because uh, last year, Councilmember Christensen was in favor of a number of resolutions in support of uh, legislation going on at the state level that had strong impacts on um, municipalities. And this ballot measure has uh, the strongest of all possible um, impacts on on um, the uh, state uh, on on municipalities and our local school districts, and it has been endorsed by the Colorado Municipal League. So um, I think it's important for for Longmont to add its its voice um, because we you know this was an emergency referral by the. Um, in the emergency session of the state legislature uh, for the purpose of making sure that uh, municipal and school budgets were rescued 
from uh, a possible loss in revenue due, due to uh, operation of the Gallagher Amendment, which would um, uh, lower the residential assessment rate by almost 2%. It won't raise anybody's taxes unless the price of their home is home's assessed value goes up at the next assessment. It just freezes the residential assessment rate where it is now. So, um, you know, I, I think it's important that we have this, this you know, this fiscal um, rescue measure um, be endorsed by Longmont because we are severely impacted by it. Certainly we should debate it. I mean, you guys can vote it down if you want to, but I think we should debate it. Any other comments from council? Seeing none, uh, just uh, quickly before we weigh in, um, I don't think there's anything inappropriate about weighing in as a council on state measures, uh, measures, say for instance, that RTD is taking. Uh, we obviously can take positions on these things as a council. Whether we do or not is a different story, but I feel that it, it's wholly appropriate to do so. Uh, so as such, seeing no other debate, I will take the vote. All in favor of Councilmember Martin's motion, say aye. 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 All, in, all opposed, say nay. Nay. So the measure passes five to one with Council Member Christensen dissenting. Uh, is there any additional motions at this time? Mayor Pro Tem, may I interject a question just to be clear? Yes. That motion did not include changing the meeting next week to a regular session. Not at this time, okay. but Council Member, Council Member Martin indicated she may have an additional motion. Very good. Council Member Martin. Um, Again, I'm, you know, the, the next regular session right now is essentially on the same day as most people will be receiving their ballots. It's just not before the ballots are mailed. So um, I'm not sure that we need to disrupt the schedule just for that. I, I think that the next regular session would be sufficient. However, um, I'm willing to listen to arguments for bringing it sooner. Okay, before we hear uh, any sort of arguments on uh, not yet made motion, which I didn't hear a motion in that statement, I'd like to ask uh, attorney, City Attorney May if we can have a procedural motion in the next meeting, not to make the whole thing a regular session, but to hold a vote on one specific item. Uh, Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney. Um, Generally, it's either regular session or study session is the way that our council rules of procedure are set up. Uh, I think you could uh, vote to have just that one item. It may be confusing for the public, uh, not knowing if, it, if it's labeled a study session, then they think uh, maybe that there isn't any formal final action that is gonna take place. Uh, so I, I would think that uh, the structures laid out in the council rules of procedure are those that would would be followed. All right, thank you, uh, City Attorney May. Any additional motions at this time? All right, seeing none, we I guess we'll move on to the public invited to be heard, according to my my script. It's time to call in now. The information is being displayed on the screen. Please mute the live stream and dial in now. We'll take a five minute break to give everyone time to get dialed in. See you in five minutes, thank you. Um, Don, can you hear me?
You're muted, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. I saw that. I, hopefully, Mayor Bagley will take uh, control of the meeting. All right, Mayor Bagley, welcome. Hey, we are. So, sorry about that, Aaron. I really appreciate you doing that for me. Thanks. And then, um, uh, where are we at? We in pub first call public invited to be heard. We are at public invited to be heard. We have one caller. Great. Let's hear who they are and what they have to say. All right. Caller with the phone number ending in 414. Please unmute and uh, state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Caller phone number ending in 414. Please unmute and go ahead and speak. Caller 414, can you unmute? Did Polly make it back from the funeral? She did. Is she here? Caller 414, can you unmute? There you are. Please state your name and address for the record. You've got three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and Council Members. Sharon O'Leary, 534 Emory Street. I'm here tonight in anticipation of the city of Longmont turning 150 years old in 2021. But paired with that excitement, it's concerned for the fear of its 175th birthday in 2046. Presently, the greatest detriment to Longmont's preservation is holes in the city's demolition requirements for historic neighborhoods and the lack of a full-time planner for historic preservation and the missing or lost architectural guidelines within the new streamlined zoning of the city. A present example is 830 Emory Street, a home within the original square mile will be allowed to add an addition to the front of their home after it demolishes the entire house above grade with the exception of the north and south walls and then replace it with a two-story mishmash of architectural styles. The demolition process does not require presentation or feedback from the Historic Preservation Commission. Another potential scenario is demolition by neglect. Because of the present code, homeowners can allow their property to just deteriorate until maybe it might need to be demolished. Or if someone, oops, accidentally demolishes their property, they are only fined $50. The penalty hardly fits the crime. In streamlining the city zoning, Hena lost their RLE zoning, which addressed architectural guidelines for new additions. This would give property owners clear guidance on what the expectations are in the developmental code. So I ask that you direct city planners to review this. First, any new construction compatibility should be de determined by the roof's pitch and overhang, window size and orientation or exterior materials. Second, new construction incorporating elements from a single architectural period. A craftsman front porch doesn't belong on a Victorian home. Third, alterations to existing homes should have minimal impacts on the streetscape. A second floor addition that changes the roof line should be stepped back. Fourth, site plans should continue the existing development pattern of the neighborhood. Maintain a front yard, a side yard, and setbacks to match the pattern within the block. Maintain ample year, year yards with garages and accessory dwelling units and setbacks towards the rear of the line. So what I'm asking you to do is to give direction to staff and walk the walk. Please put a temporary moratorium on demolitions within the historic areas such as downtown, historic east side, and historic west side neighborhood until a more thorough update is completed. To authorize staff to add protections for historic neighborhoods as a result of the new land development code. Architectural guidelines that were part of Hennett's previous RLE zoning were promised, but to date have not been completed. And finally, designate a full-time historic preservation planner rather than a part-time position that has been constantly changing. If you cannot do this permanently, then in honor of Longmont's 150th birthday, please give the present of a one-year planner so that all work can be completed. Our concern comes out of our current rapid um, 
sale of homes within the historic East Side neighborhood, Longmont's oldest neighborhood, and anything you can do to help preservation is greatly appreciated. Again, I thank you for your time and dedication to the citizens of Longmont. All right, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and uh, uh, do our COVID-19 update, Harold. Mayor and Council, um, have an, a, a quick update for you. I wanted to start off with this afternoon, um, Boulder County did release um, a, a press release and and you'll see in some of the data, they have seen a slight downward trend in the number of new cases among 18 to 22 year old residents over the last week. Um, they are seeing some increases in the other age groups. Um, and, and while the downward trend in 18 to 22 year olds is good, um, it, it indicates that the strategies they're using to start, they are starting to work. Um, they do want us to pay attention to the growth in the other age categories as we continue to move forward. Um, it's important that we continue to um, follow the guidelines that they talk about on a regular basis. Um, socially distancing, wearing face covering, limiting gatherings, um, and staying at home when sick. Um, you know, what this does, and I've talked about it before, is really we know that um, how they look at where we are in various stages is really based on the numbers and what we're seeing within our community. And so, um, they're, you know, and it could affect occupancy limits for businesses within Boulder County. So we need to really stay vigilant, I guess, was the message um, that they put out. Um, they were uh, if out front on this one. Um, if we look at the cases, we're in the red zone for new cases. Obviously, that's still a product of what we were seeing within the 18 and 22 year olds. Um, uh, but in terms of the positivity rate, we moved in the yellow zone, and I will show that to you all in a second. Um, Boulder County Public Health is going to submit a formal mitigation plan to the Colorado Department of Public Health on September 30th, based on the timelines that are, that are put in place. They're going to include evidence um, of results coming from the mitigation efforts that they've uh, put in place thus far. They will then have a conversation to see if there are any additional mitigation efforts that, that's going to be necessary. So what, what they're really saying in this press release is um, we've been doing well um, in terms outside of the 18 to 22 year old population group. Um, we've been performing better than the state has throughout this, but we're starting to potentially see a trend um, that's similar to the state in overall cases. I'm gonna bring um, this up and I'm gonna share my screen with you all. So when you see this screen, uh, this is the dial screen that we've been talking about. When you look at, and this is the one that CDPHE has, has put out, um, what you can see is we are in the red in terms of the number of cases we've been seeing. Again, when you see the other charts, um, you, you can see that it's related to um, the growth that we've seen in 18 to 22 year olds. This is the one uh, that Jeff was referring to in terms of the positivity rate. Um, if you'll remember the last time I presented on this to council, we were actually in the green. Um, we're still in the green in terms of hospitalizations based on the report I, I received from Dan this morning. As of this morning, we actually had two um, cases um, within the hospitals here in Longmont. I'm going to, can you all see the other screen with the charts? Yes, Harold. Okay. So when you look at this chart, um, you can see the obviously the spike that we hit in cases when we were talking about uh, what we were seeing with 18 to 22 year olds. Um, it's, it's been going down. Um, the last few days have been pretty good in terms of the number of new cases. Um, this is really the chart that shows the impact of that 18 to 22 year old population. As you can see, um, we had nine cases on the 27th. We had 27 on, or 29 total cases, two of which were in the 18 to 22 year old population. Um, I had a question today about you know this number. And I think when we look at it, we really kind of look here and see what's happening. But again, um, we were much lower um, 
earlier in the process. So um, just a reminder that as we're watching these numbers, we continue, we need to continue um, doing what I call the big three, wear your face mask, socially distance, and practice good hygiene. Um, when you look at the, da the, the data, um, our current five-day average percent positive is 5.9%. Overall, we are, we're at 4.3%. This really tracks what we've been seeing over time. Um, and you can see that increase where we were over six. We've now dropped and we're a little below six as we continue to move forward. Um, again, still performing a significant number of tests um, in Boulder County um, in excess of a thousand, many of the days over the last week. And so that's a good sign that they still have the, um, the ability to perform a large number of tests. Um, when you look at the transmission source, um, at least in the last data set, you're not seeing um, the orange, which is in, in the community side, you're seeing limited person to person or travel um, in those numbers. Again, um, just looking at the numbers themselves, um, a lot of cases in this age group. And this is the slide that I showed you that um, was in Jeff Zayak's slide deck um, that he presented uh, last week on the school issue. Um, they've now included on their web page, so it's something. It's a it's a good slide to see. Um, obviously, you can see that slight uptick that they're referring to in all of the other population groups. Um, but in 18 to 19, you can see where it peaked, and now they're moving down. They hope that the mitigation efforts continue performing and and show a, a further decrease. Same with 18 to 22 year olds. Um, and then uh, this graph, they're now they now have the scale set and you can obviously see where the bulk of the cases are within Boulder County. Um, again, the five day average, uh, when, when you look at the numbers, um, this is a really good sign. We hope that this continues. Again, because the numbers are really setting the playing field for how we continue to move forward. Um, and then when you look at the cases by um, where folks live, so obviously, Boulder's at 2,600 cases, we're now um, at 909. Um, and then when you look at when they normalize that for 100,000 population, um, you can see where everyone's moving, or the three larger communities are moving in the same direction uh, with Boulder at 2,400 cases per 100,000. Um, these numbers are now staying relatively consistent. I think this did, this hit three point. 30.2, it's now 30.3. And then um, when we look at long-term care facilities, you can see a couple here and there. Um, but again, nothing like we saw at the front end of um, the pandemic in the long-term care facilities. Uh, you can see then on the dials that, um, and this is one I wanna show you all. Um, if you'll remember, I think last time the available med search beds was somewhere in this area, it's now back in the yellow. Um, and then the ICU beds, they've moved into the red. Uh, but again, um, what we're seeing locally in terms of patients admitted for COVID, Dan indicated that there were two today in Longmont. So, I mean, that's the data that I have to go over with you all today. Um, obviously, we're now starting to have um, more meetings. Um, I know that they're scheduling more meetings. There was one yesterday um, with the emergency managers in terms of what we're seeing. They're gonna start scheduling those on a more regular basis um, with us to start going over information. So um, we understand what's, um, understand the situation uh, and potentially where we're moving. Um, but at this point, um, the data is very similar to last week. And uh, the big, you know, the big thing for all of us as a community is to continue doing what we've been doing, and it's wearing our mask and socially distancing as we continue to move forward. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Um, Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just a quick question. You may not have the answer to this, Harold, but uh, as far as the breakdown between CU-affiliated cases and non-CU-affiliated cases, I just was wondering where the degree of separation is for instance, if you are a couple living in Boulder, you don't work for the university, but say your nanny is a student, would that would they, for instance, if they caught a case, 
would they be included as CU affiliated? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, let us look into it and we'll get back to you with that information. Um, I think it, at least what I remember them hearing is whether you're a student or a staff member there. So that wouldn't necessarily get counted no. in that number. Okay. It, it, I don't think it would, but let me double check the answer and we'll get back in touch with you. All right, thank you. And if you remember in the, in the last week's slide deck that we had from Jeff, they actually broke down 18 to 22 and those that were associated with CU and those who weren't. So I know they're parsing that data out. All right. Thanks, Harold. All right, let's go I've on. Got, I've got one thing. We don't have right. city manager comments at the beginning, but one of the things I did want to talk about with you all, you've had a lot of questions regarding um, where we're moving with AMI, and I wanted to let you all know Dave will talk about that in more detail, but we are planning an update to council in October uh, to go over that in more detail. Now I'm done. All right, well, let's, let's hand it off to uh, Jim Golden, and let's do the 2021 budget presentation. Mayor and City Council, Teresa Malloy, budget manager. Jim, are you gonna say something here? No, go ahead. Okay, um, so if we could have our first presentation, please. And next slide. So I am joined uh, by Melody Polero. Um, so Melody, if you wouldn't mind joining me, please. Um, and together, Melody and I are gonna cover for you the priority-based budgeting. Then we have Annie and her staff, and she's gonna to talk to you about sustainability, followed by uh, Valerie, and she's gonna cover the Next Light programs. And then uh, David Hornbacher will talk, talk about advanced metering. And then Sandy's gonna cover the public, uh, the Longmont public media. And finally, Jim is gonna wrap it up with those final three topics for you this evening. So next slide, please. My comments this evening on regarding the priority-based budgeting are gonna be pretty brief for you since we did just provide a more in-depth review of our process for several of you back in June. Uh, we certainly can get into more details. Should that be desired, um, just let us know. The city has utilized a priority-based budgeting process citywide since 2013. In 2018, the process was updated to incorporate the Envision Longmont guiding principles as the desired results. As council is aware, this process includes several steps that ends with a prioritized list of city services. It includes a community involvement step to value the results. This involvement process resulted in the relative weightings of the results that you see here. This weighting was used in the scoring of the programs. The complete background information, including the steps and the scoring criteria can be found on the city's website. And we did provide a link to our information that's on the website for you in the council communication. Next slide. The city's priority-based budgeting data has been updated to reflect the 2021 proposed budget. The quartile graph on the top here shows the 2021 proposed budget the darker blue bars on the top compared to the 2020 adopted budget. 58.4% of the 2021 proposed budget supports quartile one programs with another 26.1 supporting quartile two programs. It's important to note that this is the operating budgets only and does not include any funding that is part of our capital improvement program, debt service or any transfers to other funds. In your packet, we included three PBB attachments for your reference. Attachment O is the quartile graphs for each of the major operating funds. Attachment P and Q complete are a complete list of all programs and the 2021 budget amounts broken out by personnel, non-personnel and total budget. P is the list of community programs and Q is the governance programs. 
Each ongoing budget request was evaluated from the perspective of how it aligns with our PBB programs. The second graph on the bottom um, of the slide shows our ongoing level one and level two increases by quartile for the general fund. Next slide, please. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Melody, who's gonna take you to our PBB model that is available on, on the public's, um, on, avail, available to the public on the city's website. So Melody. All right, good evening, Don. if you could pull that up, please. So good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I am Melody Polero, the Senior Budget Analyst with the City. So as Teresa mentioned, this is our budget prioritization information that we have out on our website. At the top of this is just our overall background. And then as you scroll down, you can see the um, steps that we have identified just for your information. And then at the very bottom of this screen, we have a tutorial video that will walk you through the website I will be walking you through tonight. And then we also have an email address if there's any questions, there's an email that the public um, can access that we can respond to. So Don, if you'll go to the website, please. So this is our um, PBB online data website. And this is a nice um, capture of all of the information we put together during our priority-based budgeting process. And I'll let this, oh, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you enlarge that page? It's very, Don, very small. Sure, Don, can you? Sorry, Don's driving for me tonight. <laughs> is that better? It doesn't fill the space like the other uh, presentations do. So I don't know what it is, but it's very tiny. That's as large as it will go for me. Okay, thanks. All right, sorry about that. So across the top are our community results. And you can see if you click through those tabs, the definitions below will change so that you can see how those results are defined. And then we also have in green our governance results, but I am going to focus on the housing services, amenities and opportunities for all. So if you click on that, if we scroll down, this will open up a tree plot, which is all of the departments that have programs allocated to this specific result. And on the right are our community services grouping that I want to focus on. So if we click in there, this will open up all of our community services um, divisions that have allocated their programs or their resources to these programs within this specific result. So if we take a look at the recreation division, I'm going to show you this um, program here. So what I kind of want to explain what these boxes represent. So the larger the box, the higher the dollar amount that has been allocated to this program. And then the darker the shade of the box, the higher that specific program scored to those results. So on a scale of zero to four, four being a higher score. So if we take a look at the Rec Center Program Events and Services, we can click on there and it will open up a detailed description of that specific program, the total cost that has been allocated to that program, the total FTE, and then if you scroll down, there's a pie chart and that is breaking up the personnel versus non-personnel costs that have been allocated. And then if we scroll up a little bit, there is a positions tab. And this opens up all of the positions with, that have been allocated to this. And if we scroll down a little more, those are the specific positions with the costs that have been allocated. And then if we scroll back up, there's the operating costs. And these represent the line item budget that has been allocated to this program for those operating costs. And there's that breakout below. So if we close this, we can dismiss this at the bottom of the screen. It's over to the right, hey, there you go. 
So if we go back to overall, if we click that, it will take us back to where we began. And then there's also a table view of all of this information, which then um, is able, you are able to export this to Excel for anybody who's interested in that. And that's all I have on this. So thank you for your time. So certainly feel free to poke around and play with our um, model that's on the website. And if you have any questions, um, as Melody mentioned, we do have that email address. You can send your questions that way and she will be able to answer those for you. Over the next six months or so, staff is gonna embark upon a complete update to our PBB process. And that will include the addition of an equity component to the scoring part of the process. The update will then be implemented with our 2022 budget. So that concludes our remarks for you on the uh, PBB portion of the presentation this evening. We can certainly answer any questions that you may have. All right, we're good. Next. Okay, turning it over then to Annie Noble. Aaron, I need to step away just for a sec. I'll be back in two minutes. It's yours. Okay, can you hear me and see me? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, can you start the sustainability budget presentation, please? <clears throat> thank you. Um, so, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, I'm Annie Noble, Environmental Services Manager in Public Works and Natural Resources. And I'll be presenting the sustainability budget tonight. There are several staff here to help me answer any questions. And we look forward to taking any comments or direction you may have. Next slide, please. So I have 10 slides, but I'll be brief. Um, I'm going to start out by looking at what is sustainability? What is the role of the program? And what are the funding sources? And then I'll talk about the work that's currently underway and go into the 2021 budget. And I'll conclude with a list of other citywide efforts that are related to sustainability. Next slide, please. So sustainability is often described as meeting our needs without compromising the needs of future generations. I view it as a lens from which we evaluate social, economic, and environmental factors when we make a decision. This is also called the triple bottom line or the three pillars of sustainability. The role of the program is to manage, track, uh, sorry, <laughs> manage, track, support, and collaborate on the strategies identified in the sustainability plan, which involves a wide range of programs citywide. Next slide, please. The sustainability plan identifies 10 topic areas, which contain specific actions that are categorized into immediate, near-term, and mid-term timeframes. The City Council Work Plan also directs the work of the program, and this, a significant example of this this year was the work of the Climate Action Task Force. Next slide, please. This year was the first year that a sustainability fund was established with funding contributions from various city funds. In 2021, funding contributions are being requested from the funds listed on this slide based on the topic areas that were identified in next year's work plan. 2020 was also the first year of the Boulder County sustainability tax and Longmont received $125,800 from that tax and we provided a $32,000 match. Next slide, please. So on this slide, I've listed the major components of this year's budget. The first four items were funded through the Boulder County tax, and that included hiring a grant and residential program coordinator, which is a two-year fixed term position, funding a neighborhood impact grant program, which is a fund that has been set up in partnership with the Longmont Community Foundation. Um, and that's, it provides an opportunity for neighborhoods to apply for grants to make improvements that have a public benefit. The WIC Farmers Market Program, which provides weekly vouchers for income eligible families to use at the farmers market. And then the development 
of the Equitable Carbon-Free Transportation Roadmap, which is a plan that will identify opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector. And this will be presented to Council this fall. Um, other program initiatives that were not funded through the county tax included the 2019 Greenhouse Gas Inventory, which will also be presented to Council this fall, the Sustainable Business Program, which has been helping businesses with economic recovery from COVID, other neighborhood programs like the SOUL Program, which is Sustainable Opportunities, Lifestyles, and Leadership, and that program involves um, training volunteer technicians to go into people's homes and do energy and efficiency improvements and also provide education and outreach. Um, and the last is the development of equity strategies with the support of the Just Transition Plan Committee. Next slide, please. The proposed 2021 budget is $359,000 and that's excluding salaries and a $50,000 one-time request for an update to the sustainability plan. This is the same as the base budget for 2020. And I've grouped the budget into similar categories that I just described. General sustainability includes items like temporary staff, membership dues to CC4CA, which is the Colorado Communities for Climate Action, um, programs related to waste, air quality, um, the natural environment and building and infrastructure. There's also a line item of $70,000 in the budget, um, and that's for efforts that will be funded through the Boulder County Sustainability Tax. And I'll go through that in greater detail in the next slide, please. So um, the 2021 proposed budget assumes $150,000 for work funded through the sustainability tax, and that includes a 25% match. Of the $150,000, $80,000 has already been committed, and that's for a two-year fixed-term grant and program coordinator position. Um, staff is currently seeking feedback from the Sustainability Board and through the Sustainability Coalition on four other opportunities for the remaining $70,000, which includes the continuing to fund the neighborhood impact grant, the development of a climate vulnerability risk map to identify areas, geographic areas in the city that are of climate risk um, and develop recommendations for addressing those risks, funding a temporary position, which is a climate equity and community engagement specialist, um, which could help support recommendations in the Climate Action Report, and then expanding other neighborhood programs like the SOUL program. Next slide, please. So in addition to the funding in the 2021 Sustainability Program budget, there are many proposed citywide budget requests that help support the strategies of the sustainability plan. And I have several of those listed here on this slide. This includes CIP projects um, for city building efficiency improvements, funding for transit, residential and commercial energy efficiency programs, air quality programs, waste diversion, which includes recycling and composting, and water conservation programs. So with that, next slide, I'd be happy to answer any questions and there's staff here to help me. All right, I don't see any questions, so let's keep going. Is that the second report or is there another one? I think there's somebody following me, maybe next slide. Next slide's following and then another, then David. All right, Ms. Dodd and Dale, you guys up? Yes, I am. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Bagley, members of council, Valerie Dodd, executive director of Next Light. I'm happy to be back in front of you. I'm gonna talk a little bit about 2020 results, which I think, Mayor, you've been interested uh, in lately. And I'll talk also about 21 or 2021 budgets and strategies. So we'll go to the next slide. And I always wanna make sure that we orient ourselves in the mission for Next Light. And it really is to deliver our neighbors a world of possibility by providing fast, reliable fiber connectivity while being accessible and easy to do business with. Those last two points you'll hear um, throughout my presentation. So now let's talk about the 2021 goals. 
really our goals and objectives are going to be the same probably year to year. We might tweak some of the numbers, but really what we're trying to do is drive customer growth. We're trying to make sure as many people, as many residents in Longmont as possible have access and actually have our service and can get it and afford it. So that's very important. The next piece is assuring that we have the capacity for all of those growing customers and their growing consumption, as well as a very reliable network. And then lastly, this is an important one, is we want to make sure that we're delighting our customers and our residents. We want to drive an exceptional customer experience so that they become advocates on our behalf. So next slide, speaking of the customer experience piece, um, we've done a few things in 2020 and late 2019 that have improved our customer experience. Uh, one is really recent. We have implemented a new IVR system so that customers calling into either LPC or NextLight don't have to go to the same call queue, don't have to wait in line. They don't get confused about reporting a NextLight outage versus an electric outage. So we've separated the phone IVR and then we've added in a callback feature. That way you don't have to stay on the phone waiting for the next available rep if you don't have to. So we um, have recently implemented that and are excited about it. We also, as you probably are well aware, introduced the customer connection corner or center at our service center location on Sherman. And that allows us to invite customers in to see us if they have perhaps um, hearing difficulties, if they wanna make cash payments, et cetera. Uh, we're making it really easy to do business with us at that location. We've also extended our hours of support. We have 24 seven online uh, sign up for service. We now are doing Saturday installations. It goes back to being accessible. We wanna make sure everybody working Monday through Friday, if they can't get off work, they can stay at home and get a Saturday install. And we're also making evening calls uh, or evening support available as well, two nights a week. In 2021, um, if not sooner, we're hoping, or we will be implementing a pay by phone functionality. This is important for two reasons. One, it's again, easy to do business with, um, it is for our customers. Secondly, it allows our customer service reps to work from home. Right now, they're taking a lot of payments. And in order to take a payment from a customer, they have to physically be in a PCI compliant workspace. So going forward, when a customer can just hit a number and go into a queue and make an automatic uh, credit card or bank um, account payment, then they can do that from home and they don't have to come into the office. So that's particularly important during this uh, pandemic. So we're excited about that functionality. Sandy, thank you for your help with that. And then secondly, to improve our customer experience, we are trialing some Wi-Fi mesh satellite um, devices so that if you happen to have a large home, maybe Mayor Badley does, and he has his router in the basement, but he wants his service up on the top floor, um, then this would be an extender to maximize, maximize that wireless coverage. Next slide. Now I'm going to talk about customer acquisition. So think of that as the sales and marketing arm of NextLight's operation. So in 2020, we've done some cool things. We've refreshed our logo. It's bigger and easier to see from a distance. So it helps with our branding and marketing. We added to the tagline uh, gig internet. It did have broadband before. Broadband can be copper serve three megabit. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to take full advantage of the fact that we are gigabit um, capable. So gig internet was added to the tagline. And then hopefully you've seen the beautiful fleet vehicles that we have driving around with the new logo, which looks kind of like this slide on the bottom right hand corner. Uh, we've also recently engaged a new marketing partner and agency to help us with our digital online marketing, advertising our website, and um, really helping us reach out to the right segments. Um, this is of, I think, great interest to all, and it's something I'm really proud of the team for getting done very quickly, and that's the income qualifying offers. Uh, it was something we wanted to do, COVID happened, we jumped in um, to high gear and got the necessary approvals very quickly for which I'm so grateful. So customers that have maybe never had internet or had our internet could get free internet installed at no cost and get service for two months free. Now, if they wanna keep the service, they can pay just $14.95 a month. It's a great deal. They can also get one gigabit, which some people have done. Um, and then for our existing customers that would be income qualifying because maybe they're part of a school lunch program or uh, on Medicaid, then if they were paying the higher normal rate, we allowed them to come down to that $14.95 or $44.95 price point. In fact, we reached out to all of our CARES program participants and said, you know what, we see that you have our internet service, you now qualify for this lower rate. So we were very proactive in making sure we moved them to the right price point. So that was cool. The next thing we've done is with the Sharing the Next Light program. 
you know, for one, we made sure we extended it to K through 12. Well, then we realized we might have some community college students or even local st college students um, that were Pell Grant recipients. If they are, they are now qualifying for sharing the Next Light program, which provides free internet service. Um, one other thing we did is we realized some children may be doing their schoolwork and getting their childcare from an aunt and uncle, a grandparent. Well, we needed to make sure that those children in those extended family households during the school year could get access to internet. So we're including those families as well. As long as there's a student in their home, they can qualify. Again, income qualifying part of the school lunch program. And then lastly, one thing that we were working on, um, thanks to uh, Dr. Waters, which I appreciate, he reached out to me and um, asked about preschoolers because preschoolers could conceivably get left behind if their parents are not online, getting access to information about education, about schools, about medical care, about COVID, whatever it may be. And so we're now looking to see if we can find some additional support, some other foundations that might be able to contribute to sharing the next light, su next light such that we can get preschool or families with preschoolers online. So um, Dr. Waters, we hope to have an update for you very soon. Um, and then the last thing under this uh, particular topic is the bulk internet. That's something that we implement, implemented recently with, um, oh, I'm going to think of the name, Village Co-op. And that's whereby we get 100% of those units signed up with our internet service by going through the property management organization. And they basically handle the billing to their residents or occupants. And so um, we're able to provide service to them at a discounted rate and get 100% of the occupants. It's a great thing. Now, in 2021, and or possibly sooner, we will have a refreshed website. Um, it'll be ADA compliant, and not only will it be in English, but it'll also be in Spanish. It'll be a parallel mirror site of um, the primary site. Um, we'll also have new digital ads. We'll have landing pages for those targets that we're really trying to reach that we haven't yet. And then lastly, the thing I'm really excited about, and I believe um, Harold is as well, and that is the cross-city promotion capability. And so we are hoping to get a sophisticated website such that we can promote um, if it's composting, if it's golf um, discounts, tea time discounts, or the museum or whatever might be relevant to that particular customer. We want to make sure we do um, some cross promotion with that. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned the bulk housing. Um, we're working with um, Harold and Kathy and team on doing some things with those properties. Um, for one, we're, you know, helping turn up the TLS circuit so that those properties can get on the uh, city network. Um, secondly, we're making sure that they all have fiber so that they can all get access to next slide internet service. So we're fiber, we're building out fiber to the suites as we speak. And then we're looking at doing that bulk deal so that uh, we can provide a good discounted internet price to those properties, which also happen to have tenants that might be income qualifying. So it's really getting, um, providing a great value and a great service for those properties. So we are working through that. I do wanna note that the deal that we are giving um, LHA would be no different than any other property management or apartment that happen to be serving income qualifying households and willing to sign a bulk deal. Next slide, please. So let's talk about customer results and outlook. So 2020, we're experiencing about a 9% year-over-year growth. Pretty phenomenal. Um, we're hoping to end the year with 22,500 customers. Um, that is 800 above the original forecast and budget, so pretty excited about that. Uh, in 2021, we're going to probably see a little bit of a dip in the growth, but still a 6% uh, growth is what we're expecting and uh, would end the year at 23,780. Uh, so again, that is exceeding our outlook as well. Next slide, please. Um, so I talked about those special offers that we implemented at the onset of COVID earlier. Um, so let me give you the numbers for that. The income qualifying offers, which are either the $14.95 or the $44.95, we have 432 households uh, with that service. We have 72 households that are experiencing the two months free Hopefully we'll convert them to a $14.95 customer or those customers could qualify for sharing the next light and then they would have service for a year. Sharing the next light, we have 54 households with it, but we have money right now for at least 40 more. And I know Children, Youth and Families is working hard to process those applications to get as many online as possible. In 2021, we really want to continue this focus on some of the different segments that we have not reached and a lot of those households that maybe haven't been online yet. 
So I'm setting a goal for us for us of a thousand new customers that would probably represent in, the lower income. It could represent senior households, some Hispanic households, et cetera. But we've got a map of those underserved households and that's really our target next year. Next slide. Okay, quick update on the network. Um, boy, we're growing our customer base by nine, six to 9%. And guess what? Because of COVID, uh, data utilization and consumption has gone up about 15%. So we need more bandwidth. So we've, uh, we're spending a fair bit of capital on 100G transport circuits to make sure that we have the capacity up to the internet. Um, we're spending money rehabbing the network. It's not just you build it, you're done. You got to continually rehab it. And we've been able to replace some devices that were faulty, um, reducing our trouble report rate by 50%. Um, in 2020, we have enabled over 3,000 new premises. So we've still got a lot of building to do. There's a lot of new development. So we're at about 88.5% fiber enabled. For 2021, we have a DDoS mitigation plan. Uh, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars there to uh, implement some scrubbers to make sure that we can prevent cyber attacks from cratering our, naked, uh, our network. And then we're building a new fiber hut uh, around County Line to accommodate some of the growth there. And again, we'll have probably 3,500 new premises that will be fiber enabled um, next year alone. So we'll probably in the year at about 90% fiber enabled. I told you before, we'll probably never get to 100%. For one, some apartments won't let us in. And then for two, we continue to grow and we've got to keep up with that growth. Next slide. And the employees, a huge piece of our success with Next Light. Super excited about our team. Uh, we were able to finalize our Next Light organization this year. Uh, we've got 40 employees, and that's about how it's going to stay for next year. We um, were able to organize in such a fashion that many existing employees were able to take a new role with maybe a slight increase in pay and responsibility. So a lot of good opportunity for most of the uh, employees in the organization. Secondly, we added a few uh, external hires. Um, somebody from the Geek Squad and other places. And then I'm excited to say that I um, brought on, I convinced a dear friend of mine and former coworker, Dennis Pappas, to join us uh, to help run the network piece of Nextlight. He has over 30 years experience in the telecommunications industry on the private side, has public policy experience, engineering and operations experience. So super happy to have Dennis taking over that piece. Um, another thing I'm really proud of that, uh, a committee has formed lately within Next Light, and that is to do equity and inclusion. And we know the city's got a lot of focus on that. We know we interact with customers all day, every day, and we wanted to make sure we were particularly aware and sensitive to those things. So we have a committee working on education uh, with our organization. In 2021, I already mentioned we won't be adding any headcount, um, but we're really starting to see the organization scale. We're adding customers and revenue, but we're not having to add employees. Next slide. And I'm winding down the good news. So this is kind of the summary slide. Customer count up 6%. Employee count is virtually flat. Revenue is up 9%. And that's just because we have higher paying customers. Originally, we had a lot of people in that charter membership, that $45. Some of those have churned out, been replaced with $65 customers, which is our rate card today and very competitive. Um, that also offsets some of that $14.95 uh, price point that we have in the market. Um, our operating expense is up just a little bit, some one-time expenses. The CIP, I talked about last time, it's up due to about $800,000 worth of one-time expenses. Um, so we are uh, a little net, we are a little negative on the net income side, but we're not dipping below our fund balance. So that's the great news. And I'll show you um, a couple things on the next slide. But you see at this bottom, oops. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. That's fine. So here, um, upper left-hand column, this is our ending fund balance. You see we're dipping low because we're you know, really investing and in future-proofing the network. But look at the cash that we start spinning off in the next handful of years. That is our ending fund balance over $20 million. Look at the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that um, you know, the revenue continues to grow and our expenses start declining. Uh, we've got to pay off some of the money we borrowed from LPC due to the unexpected growth and success. We'll pay that off in 2025. We'll pay off the balance of our debt in 2029, at which time um, we will be very margin rich and we'll be able to reinvest in the network and see what else we can do for the community. So last slide is a celebration. We continue to get a lot of recognition. I get a lot of phone calls and requests for media interviews because of our success. Um, we make it look easy and I, I warn everyone that it's not as easy as the team's made it look. Um, we've got rec gotten recognition for the low income offer that we did, so great news. And then once again, PC Magazine has recognized our um, exceptional product and ranked us the fastest ISP in the Western region and the fourth fastest in the country. That's all I have, thank you for listening. 
Ferguson, you look at- Can I get the, the screen back? Thank you. All right, any questions from council for Ms. Dodd? Council Member Christensen? Not a question, just a comment. Um, about once a year, I call up your uh, tech support folks and they're always fast and they're always have a good sense of humor and they always get me taken care of in no time. It's usually hold down that button that's the third from the left for five seconds and yeah, and that does it. But anyway, thank you very much. You have very good customer service and that's really, really important. Thanks. Thank you so much, council member. Council member Yago Faring, and then council member Ryan. Well, I have a question on the uh, numbers you gave us, the 72 for the two free month, the 432 for the in income qualifying offers. Are those, um, do those numbers, are they overlapping? So what, are these individual like separate? They're on separate, yes, council member, or Mayor Bagley, council member. I'm so sorry, I'm still out of practice. Um, th those numbers are separate. They're on separate rate plans. So um, okay. the, the 72 could turn into the 432 paying customers or they could turn into a sharing the next light customer. Got it. And then which ones, because I've, I've heard from parents that maybe they didn't qualify for one. Are there other offers? So let's say they don't qualify for the two, three months. Could they do the sharing the next light or what is... How is that structured? Uh, generally, if they would qualify, if they're part of the school lunch program, they would qualify for sharing the next light. Okay. Um, if they have some kind of federal um, assistance or any kind of subsidies whatsoever, then they can qualify for the discounted service, the income qualifying service. Um, if they don't qualify for those, we have some people that are receiving $25 credits for three months because they're they don't qualify for those lower income offers, but they can't really afford things because maybe they're out of work or they have reduced income. So we're making accommodations for them with a, a credit. And then worst case scenario is they could get a 25 meg symmetrical product for $35. Okay. So if they don't qualify for something, it's not if for one of the sharing the next slide or the two free months, there's still other options if they call and ask? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, Councilor Martin. Um, yes, I recently learned that um, an acquaintance in a uh, mobile home park doesn't have access to Nextlight. Um, is that true of all of the mobile home parks in in the city, or or only certain ones, or are what what outreach effort are we trying to make to to convert those? Because a lot of people there need this. Um, Mayor Bagley, um, Council Member Martin, I, the issue probably is that the management company for that trailer park probably is getting um, door fees from a competitor and therefore they're making more revenue by having just one carrier in there and so they have not signed a service agreement letting us in. So that has been um, a continual problem. We have about 2,000 premises for which we cannot get a service agreement. If you want to shoot that one specifically to me, I will take a look at it. Um, but otherwise, we are certainly trying to finish turning up everything, you know, um, everywhere that they will grant us a service agreement. Okay, thank you. I will do that. Dr. Waters. Oh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Valerie, uh, what, it's a great report uh, on great work. I mean, it's it's very impressive what uh, what you've been able to do with an outstanding, I agree with Council Member Christensen, customer service is extraordinary. I mean, you got the right people doing the right stuff. Um, and I appreciate your acknowledgement of the need to ensure that every family with young children, obviously preschool, families of preschoolers don't qualify for free and reduced lunches because they're not in school. Um, uh, and I appreciate that, that you offered to back. What will it take for us uh, to get to that place where we can say there are no families with young children in Longmont who, who are not connected. And, I, and, and, they, and the editorial I'll add is, um, I don't know how we can talk about equity in the city of Longmont and not ensure that every family with young children is connected, that they are connected. And I kind of parallel to that. I'm going to follow up, Teresa, just a heads up to you. Um, I didn't ask when, when you did your presentation 
uh, for examples, and I don't need them tonight, but I'll follow up with you, examples of programs that, that didn't score with the, with the priority-based budgeting process into a tier one or a, a quartile one, but we've chosen to fund because there are exceptions because of how they advance the cause of equity or provide for folks who otherwise would not have been provided for, right? So that's a heads up, Teresa. But Valerie, I'm curious, you know, what, what's it take for us to get there? Um, Mayor Bagley, uh, Council Member Waters, totally appreciate the question. And um, that's certainly the goal. And I didn't include our vision statement because I was trying to cut back on my words, but it is truly a fully connected long line. And so I, I can say, and I think Jim and Teresa can back me that nothing was turned down um, Harold and team and others have been very supportive of what we're trying to do, partly because we're an enterprise fund. They see that here in the coming years, we'll have some, be spending off some extra cash. Um, so I don't think that's the issue. I think it's partnering with the right people to get the right grants and the right foundations to contribute. And we started having those meetings, thanks to you again. And so we're trying to work through that. And so I'm confident that we're going to get some additional funding, but I also am going to set it up and say that um, my boss Dale and I are thinking about this in a different way as well, trying to see is there a way that we don't have to be dependent maybe on a foundation and that this can be part of our, really our business strategy. But I, I need to talk to Dale and Harold about that a little further. So I'm happy to come back in a couple of months um, with a longer term plan on how we do exactly what you suggested. I think if I can jump in on that one, I think it's also um, when you saw the fund balances in the out year. So at that point, we're going to have different options available to us. I think when we talk about social equity and the work that we're doing in, internally right now, it's also how do we work with our cultural brokers to really get the word out? Because I think that's the piece too. We've talked about this a little bit. You can put information out, but in some cases you don't, not all information. And so how do we connect within various groups throughout our community via our cultural brokers so we can really get that connection in and be able to provide those services um, to, to various residents in our community. And when we talk about the digital divide, one of the things I wanted to, to add to Valerie's presentation, you saw where she talked about the bulk rate agreements and we've talked about digital divide, not only being a problem, not only being a situation or an opportunity actually, where you deal with our younger population. It's also something we need to look at when we talk about our older populations and you're seeing Valerie engage in that conversation with her looks at bulk rates and applying the same discounts to those that qualify in different ways. So it's really a holistic look at everyone in our community. And I think as we continue moving forward, we're gonna have some um, answers to that question, but we just need to continue taking this step by step. Thanks, Harold, then Valerie. Again, uh, terrific presentation. And I, and I appreciate the fact that you and Dale are thinking about, thinking differently about how to make certain that um, every family with young kids is connected. Thank you. All right, Valerie, thank you very much for addressing the concerns that are not just questions we all had. So Dale, good job. You know you didn't say anything. Uh, you guys did great. All right, um, why don't we go ahead and take a a, a two-minute break, a three-minute break before we launch into our discussion on uh, late fees. Sound good? All right, back in a few. Come back, everybody. Sorry, I thought we were done. Sorry, guys. I could use a two-minute break. All right, let's take a two-minute. Let's, do, let's take. We're gonna take a three-minute break. Uh, go okay. break, and then we'll come back. We've been going now for almost an hour and a half. It's fine.
I'm listening to the debate in the background as we're having our meeting and what a mess. All right, now that we're back, Jim, you want to keep going with that budget presentation? Yeah, next, uh, actually, Dave Hornbacher is going to, I believe, introduce the next item on automatic metering. Great. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. I'm David Hornbacher, the Executive Director of Longmont Power and Communications. So during the CIP presentation, council asked for additional information on uh, the capital project ELE-099, which is the advanced metering. Additionally, council heard several comments from the public sharing their views regarding this, their views and their concerns regarding this project. We do appreciate and we do take that feedback seriously. Uh, as Harold had stated earlier tonight, we believe that the best path forward is to hold a study session discussion on these issues and invite a wide range of views and perspectives into that discussion. We plan to hold that study, study session uh, later in October. For tonight though, I will still provide a brief update. So this project is the largest LPC project in our budget and it transforms the current handheld uh, you know, electric metering system to a robust two-way communication system. And this provides the framework and technology to engage our customers regarding their energy use, the integration of distributed energy resources, create a connection between the renewable energy production and uh, to consumption, and other activities and policies that are essential to reach our goal of 100% renewable energy by year 2030. The 2021 budget is the second year of this three-year funded project. Rates for years 2020 and 21 that support the overall uh, Longmont Power and Communication budget as presented were approved by City Council last year in 2020. So regarding progress of this project, Longmont Power and Communications continues to pursue multiple tracks. So for example, uh, we have been actively recruiting for an advanced metering infrastructure manager. Um, it has not been an easy task trying to find the right person. In fact, we have literally for many, many months, well over half a year, in multiple job postings and numerous interviews, we've been looking for the right person. So I am happy to, to state that we're in the final stages of onboarding a new manager, and we do expect him mid-October. So. Uh, once that is official, I will uh, announce uh, information about him and he will start joining some of these conversations. Other activities we've done in, in coordination with purchasing is we've reviewed other existing uh, AMI contracts for options that might leverage these contracts for pricing and timing benefits. Uh, in fact, one that we've been reviewing very carefully is a uh, one from Colorado Springs Utilities. Uh, so Colorado Springs Utilities actually offers uh, four utilities, water, waste, water, gas, and electric. And so uh, they have significant um, benefits from what's called a volume purchase for their multiple utilities. So we've been working with Colorado Springs Utilities to evaluate uh, that bid and to see if it would meet City of Longmont's uh, needs and uh, if it might be a great uh, financial and timing benefit. As part of that too, we have also employed the firm Black & Veatch, and they are assisting us in creating a detailed functionality list and part of the contract evaluation. We also to continue to evaluate alternative modes to convey the meter signal that support advanced metering infrastructure. And this includes the radio frequency, so the RF, as well as direct connect options, and they must you know, need to meet the criteria, including technically sound, 
capability, responsive to the functionality needs, uh, financially responsible and timely deployment to meet our municipal utility and community needs. Also with this is that we are coordinating with ETS, finance and PWNR to ensure that the AMI project is synchronized with the CIS system upgrade. And that's to ensure the highest overall value and functionalities of these critical systems. Uh, and as needed, the, AM, the AMI schedule may be adjusted accordingly to ensure that, uh, that successful deployment of both of these systems. Currently, well, why we believe based on industry standard that a wireless solution is both feasible and likely the most economic and advantageous, we are continuing to explore wired solutions that may include and utilize the city's extensive next light fiber system. We are not at a final stage at this point and would certainly welcome continued community discussion on alternatives and to address the uh, customer concerns as well as the overall optimal solution for Longmont. So we do look forward to a much deeper dive with City Council here in October. We're looking to do that on October 20th. And so, uh, frankly, I'm quite excited to be uh, before Council and to share a much more uh, deeper information. So that's my brief overview pending a much more extensive discussion here in October. All right, great. Thanks, David. Um, Jim, is that it or do we have more? Uh, we do have more. So Sandy is now going to cover the Lama Public Media. Hi, Mayor Bagley, members of Council, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager. I'm here to chat with you about the Longmont Public Media contract and public access uh, media for the future in 2021. Um, so as you may remember, a couple of years ago during these budget presentations, particularly during the financial policies, the City Council asked for staff to go out for a competitive process for public access television services. Uh, the Longmont Observer was the successful um, bidder during that process, now known as Longmont Public Media. Um, and part of the, the reason that they won the bid was because they had a business model that really incorporated a makerspace idea um, at the Carnegie Building. Being able to gather and have classes and create content and all these great things that were uh, proposed as part of the RFP. As you already can guess, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly put um, certainly more than a damper on those plans for Longmont Public Media. And there are some concerns that in 2021, that contract cannot be renewed as it is today. Uh, so you may notice in your package, you have a few different options that we would like for you to consider, mostly because the city council is the sole decision maker on the contract for public access services. So I've presented a few different options for council to consider. I'll go through those briefly. We're hoping for some direction from council tonight and then we'll continue on with negotiations and bring back a contract as we get closer to the end of the year. So first of all, first option, the same level of service. So you'll see several iterations of the scope of services in your packet. The first one is what it looks like today. And so that includes, um, you know, it includes board and commissions, um, recording, it includes the, the um, voice text automated service. It includes a couple of different shows that, that uh, were specific. Um, LPM doesn't really think that they can do those services in 2021 without being able to hire some folks since the makerspace is a, is a bit paused in the COVID pandemic. So uh, they have told us that if we were able to give them $117,000 in one-time funds to kind of span that pandemic timeframe, that they would be able to continue the current contract. The second option is a reduced level of service. The reduced level of service would essentially eliminate the, count, the city council meeting recap, recording of St. Brain Valley School Board meetings, which actually happens in, in any case because the school board uh, has decided to do those themselves. Um, LPM created podcasts and paid marketing. So those are the pieces that we would take out of the original scope. Um, and for that, they still think that they would need to hire a contractor to be able to help bridge that span uh, at $76,000 again in one-time funds until they can get back up on their feet. Um, option three is a further reduced level of service. I felt that it was important, particularly in this year's budget, uh, since it is a tight budget, that you're presented an option that is revenue neutral. The revenue for 2021 is predicted to be $145,000 um, for the cable, uh, for 25% of the cable franchise fees. It is a $10,000 reduction from the current contract because that is where things are unfortunately headed is the reduction of cable franchise fees. 
This further reduced level basically takes the city of city video services out um, from 20 hours to eight hours, reduces the marketing plan, um, reduces the metrics, kind of just brings it down to sort of base level planning and zoning meetings, council meetings, and public access work. This option would cost no additional funds, but definitely brings the service levels down. Option four is to bring public access video services in-house. This is an option that the council could choose for us to pursue. Uh, we're not prepared to do that quite yet, but we could be if that's the direction the council would like for us to, to move. And then option five, bid public access media services competitively. If you'd like for us to take the services back out for bid, we could certainly do that as well. The staff recommended option is option three, um, because reducing the scope in order to meet the revenue projections because it didn't seem appropriate again for us in this budget time to bring you something that increases uh, budgetary funds. LPM's uh, preferred option is option two. Well, the LPM doesn't really um, recommend this option because they're not completely sure that they can sign that contract for 2021. We do have a few more months to be able to negotiate and to work through some different pieces. And of course, the final contract, uh, whatever it is, whichever direction council chooses would come back to council for, ratif for ratifying. So there are the different options. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions and also start asking for some general direction tonight. That converse from Longmont Public Media is also on the meeting tonight if you have any specific questions for him. All right, we, we can ask a question. I'm gonna actually move that we actually uh, endorse option three, the staff recommendation. All right, no second. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, no, I don't wanna second that. I wanna... To... Oh, I know, that's what I meant, but go ahead. No, go ahead, Polly. Didn't, didn't you want to say something? Yeah, I would move that we, so you didn't get a second? Okay. Um, all right, I would move that we endorse option two. Um, and I'd be happy to explain why, but let's see if I get a second. <laughs> I'll second it. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Motions on the floor up for debate or questions. Gaspar Christensen. Okay. Um, you know, we had a lot of a lot of work was put into already um, sending this out for competitive bid, and then they got started, and they've done quite good work considering all they had running against them. Um, I don't want us to start all over again. We have very good, we have some very good people there. We have some good facilities, but they have been uh, hit with a heavy load. You know, all of their, their financial plan, which depended upon the makerspace has been knocked out from under them. Um, I would suggest that I know this is, $76,000 is no small potatoes, but I would suggest that we could augment some of that from the council contingency plan for this one time. We have $65,000 in that. We could augment it with twenty dollars to $30,000. Um, we could find other ways to get the additional $30,000. Um, I just think we should have a little faith in them. And I really find the, the third thing of having uh, no station manager, no employees, only contractors. They've already been working as contractors for a year. That's, um, that's not a good situation. It's not fair. And I want them to be paid employees. That's the right thing to do. Anyone else? Councilmember Martin? Yeah, uh, I, would, I would be for uh, Council Member Christensen's augmentation proposal, first of all. Um, second, I, uh, there was a, a plan under discussion for a while where um, the cable trust funding would be front loaded so that the uh, uh, Longmont Public Media could continue at its existing service level and um, we could look at supplemental funding in the second half of the year based on whether conditions have changed or not and whether they are able to start uh, reopening the maker space and producing uh, their own revenue. Um, 
uh, that would maybe get us up to a service level uh, closer to number one, which is what I thought we were, we, you know, what was really the plan of record inside LPM that they had had plans for expanding their service level based on uh, increased capability to add value to the community. Um, so first of all, what happened to, to that funding approach? Uh, and uh, yeah, let's start with that. What happened to that funding approach? Mayor Bagley, Council Member Martin, I think that what's important to note is that funding doesn't usually become more avail available later in the year. I mean, you could certainly designate this as part of the budget and we could write the contract any way that, you're, that you would like to see. We don't receive all of the franchise fees at once. We receive them in chunks as well, which is why the current contract is written the way it is. Peg fees particularly, we don't give them until we get it. We give it to them as soon as we receive it, but we don't have it before that or know what, that, what the peg fees are gonna even be necessarily. Uh, but we could structure the contract any way that the council would like. Okay. Um, I The other question that I had is, uh, we, you said put it out to bid again. Um, I can't imagine what kind of bids you would get for the current funding level, um, which I, I'm, I'm assuming would be pretty much a cap on what anyone could expect to be awarded. So I, I'm not even, can you explain what that, option is in there for? Uh, Mayor Bagley, Council Member Martin, only because it was a previous direction of the council. It's always an option if you wanted to put it out and see what else was out there, but I, I would say we just did complete the last one, so it's not recommended. Okay, well, let's, let's, proceed. let's proceed as far as I'm concerned with Council Member Christensen's proposal then. All right, let's go Dr. Waters, then Council Member Peck. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, my, my personal preference would be to fund them with option one and, um, and, and hold their feet to the fire to deliver. And, I, and I'm confident they will. Um, I, think, I, I, think that's, I think that's what we ought to do. The difference of $40,000 uh, and a $371 million budget, I don't think is that big a deal. I heard Jim last week, both identify both the stabilization reserve and the um, and the fact that we haven't budgeted uh, all of our sale, all of our property tax revenues. I know we're going to get an update on on uh, the effects of gallegorizing or undegallegorizing, if depending on how, how the vote goes. Um, but I, I, there's still a pot of money. I don't. With I, I appreciate the the thought about the contingency. I guess I don't feel like we have to go there yet. Uh, I'd like to hear more from Jim. I think I think we've got some one-time money that where we don't have to commit the contingency, and I think we have enough one-time money to fund this at, at at option number one. If if we're not going to consider option number one, I'm certainly going to support number two. I think of the of the of the five options we heard from Sandy, uh, my preference would be to fund them at option one. Joan, thank you, uh, Mayor Bagley. Um, Actually, this is a question for Sandy. I'm curious as to why staff recommended option three. What was it in option three that staff thought was worth, worth supporting? Mayor Bagley, Council Member Peck, I think we were concerned about bringing any enhancements of services or anything that's gonna cost additional funding, particularly in this budget process. Would, was that uh, a hiring or only going with uh, contractors part of that? I believe that would be the plan from Longmont Public Media is that they would only be able to hire contract work to be able to liaison. It would, it would basically be a very bare bones type of um, operation at that point. Okay, thank you. All right, Councilman Martin. Um, yeah, so Sandy, this question is for you too and it has two parts. One is um, you have a, a really high level of, of devotion and, and uh, passion and commitment on the, uh, among the existing LPM employees. Um, and so there is a big opportunity cost for letting those people go. Um, how do you value that as opposed to what you would spend this budget money on um, 
if you weren't spending it on paying those uh, wages. Mayor Bagley, Council Member Martin, that's a pretty tough one to discuss because then you're talking about everything that everybody asked for in the entire budget and how we value that in comparison to this. I will tell you that running a, a cable television station is not easy and there's a huge learning curve to it. And so certainly Longmont Public Media and city staff have been learning together over the last several months um, on all kinds of things from not only equipment and how to do it and all these different pieces, but also programming and communication and conversations. And so um, to some extent, I would say that's priceless. <laughs> um, and you know what I, what I would mention is just that we wanted to make sure that we were presenting you options that also left the, the revenues as they were intact with no changes. And so we wanted to give you the entire gamut um, of, of conversation. So I would say that we value it very much uh, that they're able to do the work that they are able to do. Um, and we certainly wouldn't recommend, like I said, going out for bid again. That's not our recommendation. <laughs> yeah. Um, it just seems like, uh, uh, you know, we, we have not laid very many people off in this budget. Um, and and it's, as, am I correct in saying that it, the only layoffs have been in the recreation center where, you know, there is really no work to be done? Um, and uh, LPM, I mean, I understand they're not city employees, but in fact, um, there has been so much work for them to do in terms of crisis management that uh, they, they really are essential, learning curve or not. Um, so, you know, as I uh, honestly, when Council Member Christensen mentioned option two, I was thinking in the mode of, of, well, that's the best we can do, or they wouldn't have recommended below that level. Um, but hearing Dr. Waters advocating for um, option one and remembering that we have a big contribution in the stabilization fund this year compared to prior contributions, um, I am... Um, uh, inclined to offer a friendly amendment to uh, council member Christensen's and, you know, going big. Um, what do you think, uh, Polly? Do you think you could, you could spring for option one? Well, I personally can't spring for anything, but I, <laughs> I just think that, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just very difficult right now. You know, we're all, we're going to have to, cut on a lot of things and I just think it's it would be really hard to spring for a hundred and seventeen thousand dollars more I, I think it's going to be hard to uh, go for seventy six thousand more so I don't know I, I, I would rather stay with two that would that seems to me more fiscally sound right now. All right, so let's hear from Mayor Pro Tem and then let's have a vote. If it passes, great. If not, we'll go on to another option. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I believe a couple of the ideas that I heard uh, spoken about so far that I think are important. One is flexibility. I believe I heard Assistant City Manager Cedar say that there's some flexibility still and we don't have to necessarily lock in tonight. I think that's important. Uh, one of the other important things I, I think we should talk about is open coverage of governmental affairs. And we know that their city has no ability to help increase coverage uh, through the newspapers and through the Longmont Leader, for instance. But we do have the ability to be as open and transparent as we can by having a robust public media uh, whether it be a different contractor or this contractor and making sure that that, that option is available to the public, I think is very important on our behalf. Um, I also think that kneecapping basically the Longmont Public Media Organization in a completely unprecedented year budget wise after just receiving the, the contract, because I think that their level of service is above and beyond what we had before in the city uh, as far as all the various boards and commissions that they're going as well as the other things that they're providing service for and so a big ask i actually agree with council member waters and that 117 to me is not a big ask 
uh, compared to 76. I don't think that that's a big amount of room to cover when we're talking about the budget that we have, as well as the services that are actually being provided to the public. These are one of very obvious reasons or one of the various obvious services that is provided to the public that they can see and find to be tangible and see what they're getting for their money. So I am open to option two. I prefer option one personally, but I'll vote uh, either way, knowing that we have the flexibility moving forward that say we go with option two this time and find out that there is some wiggle room to get us up to 117, then I would also support amending it at that time as well. Um, but I think this is a vital, a vital service that I don't think we should be looking at cutting uh, as far as transparency between city of Longmont and the residents of Longmont. So that's just kind of where I sit on this one. All right, so there's a motion on the floor for option two, and it sounds like we might have a few folks who vote for Mayor, can I jump in? Sure. So uh, just maybe to answer a few questions and give some uh, more information. Uh, um, Councilmember Waters did ask about the uh, stabilization reserve. We did talk about that a week or two ago. That certainly that could be utilized for whatever means. Just realizing that that's one time dollars. We will have, um, we, we, are, we will be getting, I did actually get hours of just a few hours ago, assessed valuation information from the county. So we do have that earlier than we expected. I'm not gonna say for sure how much that is until Teresa and I agree that we're assessing it correctly, but it's, it's in that neighborhood of the cost of neighbor of, of uh, option one. So if, if I'm calculating it correctly. So um, there are options, just keep in mind that that's one-time money and that this, this contract is typically covered by ongoing revenue. And so I think that the logic is though that uh, the expectation would be in hopefully in 2022 that operations would pick back up, uh, hopefully out of it coming out of the COVID uh, situation and that, that they wouldn't need to rely on that level of revenue again year after year because we, we don't like to commit one-time money uh, on an ongoing basis. All right, Marsha, you've, you've had more than two comments on this motion. So I mean, I'd like to just vote on it. So it's we've we got, okay, we've had, so let's go ahead and uh, vote. Option two is on the, of Dr. Dr. Waters. I don't think you've had two. You're right, I have not had two. So thank you for acknowledging me for a second comment. Um, and, I, and I only will say this. Um, I think if we want First of all, I appreciate Mayor Pro Tem's comments and, and the other comments that have been made about the value that, that LPM has brought to the city, I think far beyond what we'd experienced in the past. I think if we want to position them, acknowledging this is one-time money, as Jim said, we want to position them to be able to be viable in 2022, then I think we need to make the investment this year optimizes that poss that possibility. I think if we put them on a shoestring, which I think that option two does, it keeps them kind of status quo. Um, I, I just think if we're gonna take, if we're gonna invest one time to try to get them ready to, to be viable over the long run, then we ought to commit to option one as, as w the $40,000 is not gonna be big a difference in a, in a 2020 budget. And, uh, and give them the chance to, to hit the ground and, and finish the race. So. Have you spoken twice, Joan? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and call on Joan. So um, thank you, Mayor Bagley. So here's my thought. There are other things in this budget also that I, am, I wanna bring up about perhaps we should look at as a priority and fund. So is there any way, when does this contract have to be signed, Sandy? Mayor Bagley, uh, Council Member Peck, they're, they're under contract currently until the end of December. So this contract, you know, we wouldn't have to bring back to you until we got closer to the end of the year. So I was wondering uh, if we could put this off until we bring out all of the issues that we would like to fund. And Jim can actually give us some some hard numbers and, and how 
you know, one-time funding I agree with, but there are other things that I think we should look at funding a little better as well. And um, so I don't want to make a motion where we take all of that pile of money and put it in one place. So um, I'm gonna vote, a, I would vote for two, but I really would like a little more time on this contract if, if others feel that. All of these discussions are important and they're valid, but I don't wanna make a decision on a half an hour discussion on this um, when we have a whole budget that we have to figure out. So that, that's my thought. All right, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna probably vote no so we can vote for number one. But if two passes, that's okay too. It's not the end of the world. All right. So we've got a motion on the table and uh, de uh, delegating staff to proceed with option two. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. All of that's an aye. Councilmember Doggo firing. All right. All opposed, say nay. 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 Is that a nay, Marsha? Were you aye or nay, Marsha? I was an I because I thought it was good to put a stake in the ground for at least that much. I wanted to so go the, with Mayor our, Pro Tem's plan. But, all right, so with the motion passes four to three with Councilmember Martin, Councilmember Christensen, Councilmember Peck, and Councilmember uh, Hidalgo Faring uh, voting for the motion. So, all right, let's move on to actually, Jim, is there anything else? Yes, there are just a few more budget presentations. Uh, I'll be handling them. If uh, we get the last PowerPoint, please. Um, we'll begin with the uh, topic of the special marijuana tax. Um, uh, next slide, please. And the next slide. So the tax was uh, passed in late 2018, began to receive revenue. Uh, about a month after that, uh, the first full year was 2019. We had $265,000 of tax revenue. In 2020, our budget for tax revenue is $274,000. We did have $137,000 uh, from 2019's tax revenue that went for affordable housing. And here in 2020, uh, we budgeted 137,000, again, half of the budgeted tax revenue for 2020 for affordable housing. And then $87,000 of council designated for uh, HSA funding and $50,000 for early childhood education. So next slide, please. So in 2021, we're projecting the tax revenue to come in at about 410,000, which is, uh, Sim similar to the pace that we're on this year. So there will be money uh, in excess of budget for t in 2020. Uh, the 2021 proposed budget so far only includes the half of the amount, 205,000, again, designated for affordable housing. So there's another 205 that could be directed by the city council. Uh, the, in 2019, since the council never designated any use of the second 50%, we do have left over from that $132,000 and change that the city council can direct for one-time usage. So as we just finished discussing different sources of one-time money, uh, this is also one that's available when you are giving us direction. And by the way, we will be looking for direction from you, final direction on the budget uh, on the night of the 13th. So this can, uh, all wait until then, unless you wanted to talk about it sooner. Next slide. That's all I had on the marijuana tax, unless there's questions on that. I'm not seeing anybody, so let's continue. Next slide. Uh, now, uh, the DDA budget. So uh, I've given you uh, quite a bit of information within your packet on the Downtown Development Authority budgets. The DDA Act budgets actually have uh, six individual funds within the DDA. And then in addition to that, they also do propose budgets to you for the downtown parking fund and the general improvement district. So I've given you all a lot of information on those budgets within the council communication. I'm not gonna uh, take you through them. The one thing I am gonna talk about, uh, their biggest source of dollars is tax increment financing. We uh, have that, um, budgeted so far for 2021 at about 1,075,000 
which is actually the, uh, the level that uh, we're expecting to receive in 2020. So we've just uh, transferred that forward until we uh, get word from the county about that amount. But, and anyhow, um, what I wanted to point out to you is uh, some of the uses for those monies that are budgeted in, in 2021's budget. You already did hear during the CIP presentation about the downtown plaza rehab for 100,000. In addition to that, we're using TIF dollars for marketing collaboration of $30,000, redevelopment of 25,000, employment incentives for 100,000, economic vitality for 10,000, and art and entertainment funding programs. We do this annually, it's 289,000 for 2021. Uh, Kimberly McKee is on the line. She can answer questions about any of these proposed usages. Uh, we also do use the uh, monies from the TIF uh, for project management on our capital projects, and as as well as we do uh, have amount of dollars that goes to infrastructure replacement downtown every year. Uh, any questions on the DDA budget or the GID budget? Doesn't look like we have any. Let's keep going. All right, we can move into the final item and that's uh, the Gallagher Amendment. So uh, first I wanna point out that, um, you know, the city's, uh, uh, what we do with uh, the property tax detail, what we do, we, it's basically administered by the county. We receive money from the, from the county every month based on their collections, uh, but the, uh, the actual administration of property tax is done by the county assessor's office and the, the collections and uh, forwarding to us by the, the county treasurer's office and they all fall, have to follow the state statutes in those regards. So, uh, you know, we're not the experts on, on a property tax, um, but on the, having said that, I put together information that I have gathered from a few sources, uh, mostly from CML. Uh, the, actually the best source that I have found of information on this topic is in the election blue book. Uh, it does have quite a bit of detail, it's useful. So, but I will take you through uh, and I'm gonna keep it to uh, factual information since this isn't a ballot question. Uh, the first slide, please. So uh, the property tax uh, is paid on a property's, um, uh, sorry, I'm just, Fix my slides here. A property's actual value. Uh, assessor determines the actual value of a property. Um, the actual value is then multiplied by the assessment rate to get the assessed or taxable value. But the assessed value is multiplied then by the tax rate, which is our mill levy and any entity's mill levy to get to the amount of the tax owed. Next slide, please. So the Gallagher Amendment uh, passed in 1982. And the, the intention of it was to maintain a ratio between the taxable value of property as 45% residential and 55% non-residential. That's the ratio it was back in 82, and it intended to keep that in place. And it's statewide, not on a, a say a city or a county level, but the whole state. So the res residential uh, property value since then has grown uh, much faster than non-residential has. The non-residential ratio is fixed at 29%. Well, because of the growth in residential property values, the residential ratio has reduced from 21% back in 1982 to what is currently now 7.15%. Uh, the residential rate would have increased six times since 1999 uh, underneath the Gallagher Amendment but for the fact that Tabor, since it was passed, prohibits that type of an increase to occur without a vote. So this is where uh, Gallagher and Tabor come into conflict with each other. Next slide, please. So Amendment, P Amendment B would repeal the Gallagher Amendment. The General Assembly also adopted a statute that if this does pass, the, they would freeze the current assessment rates at 7.15% residential and 29% non-residential. Now that uh, is something that could be changed by future legislators, but they could only reduce either of those rates uh, because again, because of Tabor, they're not able to increase those rates without voter approval. Next slide, please. 
So the residential values continue to grow. Um, Non-residential values are expected to drop in the coming year, uh, in the next uh, assessment year. And due to the impact of uh, uh, COVID on business. So business values are expected to drop. So between uh, the residential value, values growing and the non-residential dropping, the state property tax administrator is projecting that uh, the resident under, under the Gallagher Amendment as currently uh, in place, the residential ratio would drop from 7.15% to 5.88% in 2021. That's an estimate. Um, estimates have differed from actual in, uh, in the more recent non, uh, um, more recent assessment years. So applying that projected decrease to the current 2019 assessed values, which is what our 2020 revenue is coming off of, the staff calculates that, that, a that there would be a reduction of property tax revenue of $2.1 million for the city. Now that's just the impact of the reduction in uh, the residential ratio. Uh, if there's growth uh, from new construction or new or growth in values, that would, uh, would uh, offset some of that loss. How much, who would know? Um, I took the same methodology and applied that to the uh, property values for the, the county and the school district and their impacts would be 20.2 million for the county and 19.4 million for the school district. Uh, with the school district, it's a little different though. The impacts uh, could differ because uh, their impacts could be offset by the state. So I think that that might be my last slide. Yes, so try to answer any questions if you have any, otherwise it's all I had on the, on the Gallagher Amendment. Councilmember Christensen. Jim, the, the state legislators put this on the ballot because they've been squabbling about this for 10 years and they couldn't figure out a way to fix it. So they're kind of throwing it off on us. But why couldn't they just adjust, make a, a different adjustment to the proportions? Is that set in the law? The, the, the Gallagher Amendment is in the Constitution. So what yes. they're doing, they're doing is, is they're following the Gallagher Amendment uh, right. every assessment year. Their hands are tied in that respect. So there's no flexibility in adjusting those ratios? Not as long as Gallagher is okay. in place as Okay, as I understand. Yeah. What a mess. Okay, thank you. Um, no, I don't think All right, thanks, Jim. Um, you bet. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, you have one, one other one, one, don't you? I do not have another thing. I just wanted to point out, though, this is the last of our planned presentations in relation to the proposed budget. If there's something that the council uh, thinks is missing that there we're looking forward to hearing about, let us know. We can bring it back next week if, uh, if that'll work on the agenda. Uh, our intention though is to return to you on the 13th, uh, asking you for final direction on uh, the 2021 budget. All right, John. Thank you, uh, Ryan. Uh, Jim, I just, well, actually, I want to throw this out to all of council. Uh, I don't want to make a motion tonight, but um, we all know that the library needs to be funded. It's in the feasibility study. It has been talked about here for years. Um, it is underfunded. I would like for us, as we talk about the one-time funding that we have both in marijuana and uh, the other places that you told us, Jim, when we do the budget, I've always heard that we have carryover from past years that we're carrying over into this budget. Uh, so here's an idea that uh, I would like us to think about in funding the library more is some of our big funds like the public safety fund, like the fleet fund, like the water fund, they, are, they always have carryover from the past years um, that they haven't used or they uh, didn't get time for the projects that they wanted. So they have that carryover funding, which gets put back into their budget. Um, Jim, I was wondering if there is a way from perhaps cutting those budgets. I know they're, 
the directors aren't going to like this idea by a half a percent or uh, some of the one-time funding either from marijuana or, or the other places, if we could put more money into the library, we've really got to keep that library viable and up. I know that we probably can't fund it to the extent that the feasibility study said it needs to be funded, but, but could you come back to us with some cobbled monies that we could put into it, whether it's one time, whether it's uh, ongoing, and, and let us know if that's a possibility. And that's why um, I didn't want to vote for number one uh, that uh, Councilman Waters suggested, because I do feel that this is a, a, an area that we really need to pay attention to. And um, before we get into that feasibility study, let's see what the city can do. Uh, so there you go. I just want council to think about that. And uh, hopefully, Jim, you can bring back some ideas for us. Well, I, I will bring back what I can, but I do, I will state right away that the only place I would be looking is in the general fund. You mentioned a lot of different funds and all of those monies are in separate funds because they are intended for a specific use. A lot of them legally are, in, are, are restricted in, for use. So they, they couldn't be used for the library. Okay. Second, secondly, um, the monies that we would be talking about would be one-time money. So they could not be used for ongoing expenses for the library if we're gonna keep with our financial policies. Uh, but again, it'll probably come back to what we talked about uh, during the, the last discussion here uh, regarding the public media that we have certain amounts of dollars that we were moving towards a stability reserve. If you wanna instead choose to use those for one-time purposes for the library, that option's available to the council and we'll bring that information back to you. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and take a three minute break and then go on to our last item of the evening. All right, back in three.
Just waiting on Aaron, and we'll go ahead. Aaron, can you hear us? All right, let's go ahead and move on to the last um, item, the rental fee uh, moratorium, or the late fee moratorium. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Karen Roney with Community Services. So I will introduce this item, which Council asked us, uh, asked staff to bring back uh, recently in um, I believe in August of this year, the city and county of Bloomfield did adopt an ordinance which uh, enacted a temporary prohibition of property owners to assess late fees uh, when there was um, late rental payments, um, basically due to, uh, to COVID related hardships. So, so we, um, we are bringing forward to city council tonight, um, uh, an ordinance that is uh, very similar to what the city and county of Bloomfield did um, did enact, which basically, uh, um, in, in essence, temporarily prohibits property owners from um, assessing fees for late rental payments. Um, and it, it does include some suggested documentation for um, for how to how um, to establish a hardship if you are a renter. It suggests that the prohibition ends with, um, with either the expiration of the Centers for Disease Control Eviction Moratorium Order, which is uh, set to expire the end of this year, or unless that is extended, um, or when the governor rescinds the um, declaration of the emergency disaster related to COVID-19. We also suggest the penalty under this um, for a violation of this section of the uh, um, ordinance would be by fine only. And um, we suggest that $500 certainly are open to uh, what kind of uh, um, input that, that city council would have. So in essence, this uh, the ordinance before you is very similar to the city and county of Greenfield. Um, our city attorney, Eugene May, was uh, in contact with the city attorney with the city and county of Broomfield and responsible for drafting the ordinance. If, if you have specific questions, I'm sure uh, Eugene would be, um, would love to answer those. So I think the, um, the only couple of things that we want to add, then obviously we'll open it up to direction from city council is that we really did not, um, 
because there was an interest in moving, bringing this back fairly quickly. We did not, you know, spend a lot of time doing additional analysis, really looking at what the impact is for, um, for Longmont renters, or to really look at what some of the unintended consequences could be by uh, passing this particular ordinance. So, so this, this communication does not include any of that particular um, analysis. And so we, we just wanted to, to point that out. The other thing we wanted to point out is that uh, Governor Polis did appoint a, um, a, a task force that has, uh, that basically started to meet um, the mid part of, of September to also advise the, um, the governor as well as the, um, the Department of Local Affairs on various strategies to really look at housing stabilization. So um, they are to bring back their recommendations to, to the governor and to DOLA by mid-October. There was a 30-day window once they had their initial meeting. And they also might be discussing statewide um, a variety of strategies which could, in, you know, which could include a, a, a temporary prohibition on late fees assessed for um, late rental payments. So, so there is a, there's, there's a, you know, so we could continue to have, or we could have a piecemeal legislation, which we talked about, or there could be certainly a, a statewide recommendation for how to address um, housing stabilization and, uh, and rent fees prohibition of, of late fees could be part of a, a statewide effort too. So we just wanted to point that out. And, um, and, and at this point, really turn it over to city council to provide staff direction on whether to bring back a, an ordinance for first reading or and, and any modifications or anything else that you would like to direct us to do. All right, Council Member Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Karen, uh, uh, thank you for explaining that task force. When I read it, I realized that um, late fees were not really the target of what they were getting at. But if they do uh, address that and come up with some ideas, I would like to add that the temporary, uh, let's see, how do I put it? that this temporary thing would also include whatever that task force comes up with with late fees, because that may determine a different end date for this and a better one, a better outcome. Um, so I think we should put that in this ordinance as one of the, uh, at the very end, as the, uh, one of the options of, of when, how long we extend this based upon the result of that task force, if they do in fact address late fees. I don't know what kind of wording to use. I think that's probably Eugene's area. But uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up because we've, we've had emails, not as many as I thought we would get actually in phone calls. And you addressed that saying you hadn't really done any outreach for this. Uh, Susan Spalding is the one who actually has those monthly meetings that Susie Hidalgo and I went to. Is there, do you know when that next meeting is? Because I think that would be a great place to get feedback and uh, address this. That is a great question. And um, I do not know, but I see my colleague, Carmen Ramirez, um, <laughs> that is still here in the... Still, still with us. So I don't know, Carmen, if you know when the next uh, landlord tenant meeting is. So usually their uh, council, good evening, sorry, Carmen Ramirez Community and Neighborhood Resources. They're held the second Wednesday of each month. Uh, with the issue of Zoom, we've had a, a little bit of issues on presentations, uh, but we could definitely do one or two things, convene the meeting as we typically on a monthly basis and or send out some questions because we have quite a large uh, contact list to landlords as okay. you do. That would be great. I think that would be a good way to get some uh, feedback from the property owners. Uh, my other question is, uh, and this is what, Karen, you probably know. When I talked to Susan Spalding later, in, earlier in the spring, 
she mentioned that she did uh, renter landlord one on ones to work out some kind of a situation in the, and that the city could use that neighbor to neighbor fund to uh, help with the landlords getting some support from the rent if the renter could not working out a compromise between them. And the reason I'm saying this is that I don't want the property owners or the landlords to think that the city is not concerned about them losing revenue that they need to pay the mortgages on these places. So I think that message needs to go out and I would not be adverse to using some of the council contingency fund to uh, help landlords be in and uh, well landlords property owners make up some of the rent that they might be losing during this time and I see Harold has an answer for me <laughs> so um, if you remember when we were talking about the cares funding during uh, last council meeting I'm oh. going to go over everything that we're actually bringing to bear for uh, individual housing assistance so in, in the CARES component, we're putting 400,000 for utility assistance, um, we, and we have 126,000 for um, housing services support. So that's um, 526,000 in, in that, out of that bucket for the individual support. And then when you move over into the CDBG CV funding, um, we talked to council about putting 657,000, a little over 657,000 for individual housing assistance. So in, in the arena of all of the expenses that individuals have related to housing, whether it's utilities or the housing perspective, um, we have over a million dollars that we're putting in via the CV funding and the CARES funding. Thank you, Harold. I didn't realize that that uh, applied to property owners as well uh, for their. It, 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 what, that's it won't. What, it won't. That that is so. If somebody's having trouble making their rent, we want to work with them so that we can use those funds so they can pay their rent to the property owners. Okay, so you don't work with the property owners directly. No, but in that world where where um, Susan is working on that issue between the property owner and the renter, that's where we have the ability to bring those funds to bear so that we can provide assistance. Now, again, there has to be a COVID connection in this. So if it's lost their job, they were furloughed, I mean, those COVID connections are there to provide that assistance. Similar to the way this is written, I believe this is written is the COVID connection has to be there. Okay, so uh, Carmen, when, when you do reach out to these people, then perhaps that could be explained a little better that it wouldn't go to the property owner, but it would help rental assistance to make up part of that. And, and if I can I, add, I, I think- They understand that is my, is my point. Oh, I didn't. okay. And I think if I can add to that, what I would say is it, it may go to the property owner, but the conduit is the individual coming to us because we can't we have to ensure that those funds are being utilized for their intended purpose. Similar to how we talked about the um, early childhood education, they would come to us, we would then go, you need X, we would then pay property owner X so that we would have the necessary documentation so we don't have clawbacks. I think that's a great idea. And um, it would be the reason I think the property owner should know about this as well as the renter is that they could tell the renter where to go for, for help. So a little different communication. Thank you. So Councilwoman Peck, if I could just add, we repeat that message around our mediation service and connecting people to resources so they're tenants. So we do that very often, whether that's via email or our education classes, do that on a regular basis, letting them know that we're here to connect tenants to resources so they can pay their rent as well as serve as a communication and mediation between the landlord and the tenants. So we, we're doing that on a regular basis also. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, I think it was Councilmember Christensen and then Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Carmen and Karen I, and, and Harold. I, I just think it's, it's very important that property owners understand that 
This is not punitive towards them. We're just trying to keep people in their homes. And um, that the idea is that if everybody can work together a little bit and they can use the city to work together to get this help that they need so that everybody winds up doing a little bit better, yeah. I, I think a lot of, well, the landlords that I spoke with um, didn't, they seemed to think it was up to the tenants to, they, they, they seem to think that tenants had all the rights and blah, 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 blah. Um, I just want tenants and landlords to feel like they can work together and have a happier situation. Uh, Marsha? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I, uh, I just would like to say that, that I think the more holistic approach and um, you know, offering assistance to tenants so that they can um, meet their obligations to their, their contractual obligations to the landlords is a better approach um, than uh, reducing their obligation under contract. And the reason for that is that the latter uh, can have un, unintended consequences. So um, if a landlord is already stressed, because remember landlords have obligations, not just uh, what was mentioned, you know, property taxes and insurance, or even a mortgage. Um, but they also have the obligation to maintain the property, um, to spend money to keep it leased up, met with, with um, you know, new tenants. So get people in housing when, they, when, they, when there are vacancies. Uh, put a new roof on the place. Um, so there are, um, and, and um, not just late fees, but various fees, security deposits and all kinds of stuff, typically go into a budget that is, that the, that the landlord earmarks for that. So, you know, we wanna keep the places that people are living decent. So um, bailing out stressed tenants rather than, um, uh, reducing their obligation to their landlord is just, <coughs> excuse me, a better way of keeping um, money flowing and budgets satisfied. And uh, I think it's it's also necessary to to you know sort of have a unified solution uh, for the same reason you know so that we don't find people moving from municipality to municipality based on um, where they can get the best deal. I was just gonna. Okay, I'll, you go ahead, Eric. You you first. Then I'll no, say no Mayor Beckley, please go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that I, I don't think that that council has the expertise, or the the or nor should we have the authority to be telling private property owners um, how they should charge their late fees. We've got a. They've all got contracts, and uh, and. I don't, I don't know why the renters would be seen as needing help when maybe the landlords need help. They've got mortgages. They're not all big, rich people. Some of them are struggling to make their mortgage payments. And it's not just that you could say, oh, well, it's only $15 or $25 or whatever the late fee is. But um, those late fees encourage people to pay their rent on time. And so if people don't pay their rent on time, mortgages aren't made on time. And when mortgages aren't made on time, then you've got defaults. And so while it sounds really good to be able to say, hey, let's go ahead and help people by saying, you don't have to pay this. Um, we have no idea how this is gonna impact people. And um, I, just, I just think it's a huge mistake. And I think it's overstepping our authority. All right, what a city count, uh, go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I understand the, the point of what Broomfield did with this one. Um, I feel like for us, due to the lack of data really, that we're going from not an A to B, an A status quo to B solution issue here. I think we're going from A status quo to D, A solution, but we haven't taken the time to connect the steps yet. Um, we don't have the data as far as, you know, I, personally as a renter myself even, uh, there are those folks who have no problem making their rent. There's those folks who have made accommodations with their landlord so far. And so then we're talking about probably a, a subsection there that is unable to make the accommodation with their landlord. Uh, 
as well as they're unable to just normally meet their rent requirements. Um, so I, I want a, before we went to straight up banning late fees, I would want to see somewhat what the numbers are uh, because I'd also rather, before we went straight to what I would call the jackhammer approach uh, with a straight ban, uh, I'd like to see us provide support for those folks that are possibly incurring late fees that they can't afford, or, or as was, I think, proposed in the council communication, that we might look at a cap on late fees before we look at an absolute ban. Um, I just feel that there are some steps in between uh, where we are at now and what's being proposed in this ordinance before we get to the straight ban. Um, so I'm just, I'm a little mixed on it until we explore some other options that I feel that because of the haste of this suggestion, we haven't explored yet. So I'd like to, I definitely would like to hear some other comments from the council. Uh, Dr. Waters. Yeah, thanks Mayor Bagley. Um, uh, I appreciate the Mayor Pro Tem's comments about uh, getting a little bit more information. I, I, I think that would be helpful as well. And, and in that information, uh, Karen, you you were specific to point out that there's been really no analysis of unintended consequences. And I can I'm sitting here imagining what the unintended consequences might be, right? If the city says I can't collect late fees, what I'm going to do is I'm going to double up on my security deposit, right? Or I'm going to I'm going to do things that protect my interest, and in the long run hurt the very people we're trying to help. So I'm sympathetic to what I'm, to the ordinance and to what Broomfield did, um, but I but I would like to get a little bit more data, both in terms of increment the, the kind of data uh, Aaron was talking about, but also what your take is on unintended consequences, and it may be that that uh, uh, Susan has a pretty good idea of that as well. Um, the other thing is um, if the if the task force that you mentioned the governor has convened, comes forth with a plan that includes late fees, uh, that's likely to occur before we would get this to a second reading anyway, isn't it? Or not? It, it, at this point in time, uh, Council Member Waters, the, uh, um, I believe the first task force meeting was around September, uh, so in answers, yes, is the answer. It's a quick answer to your question. If everything goes according to um, plan, that you know by mid October there would be a set of recommendations uh, presented to the the governor and Dola. Yes. And uh, are, would you assume, or should we assume, that if they were to include late fees in whatever those, uh, whatever that order is, and I assume it would be a, an executive order, um, that 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 would that would trump or preempt. Uh, anything we might be doing with an ordinance? You know, that's a good question, Councilman uh, Waters, and I really don't have the, you know, have the answer to that. But um, but certainly, we we would certainly know by mid October what that set of recommendations is, yeah. um, and and that certainly would inform what actions yeah. we want. All right. To okay. Take. Thank you. To to give you specific dates, if we. Um, First reading would be on the 13th because the 6th is a study session. And then second reading would be on the 27th. Uh, uh, Council Mayor Christensen. So if the governor doesn't do anything, then we are starting from scratch uh, in mid-October. Um, I'd like to read something that um, um, Sharon Tissier, who's a councilman at uh, Broomfield, wrote. Um, Councilmember Law Evans and myself, representing both sides of the political spectrum, worked together to ensure that equity was in place for both tenants and landlords. We consulted with a lot of landlords and tenants alike. This ordinance honored and respected the landlords who were already working with their tenants, they are leading by example. Unfortunately, there are still a lot of landlords and leasing agencies who are making profits off of someone else's demise during COVID and beyond. Late fees were not put in place to make a profit or to be punitive, but to be a fractional incentive for collection of rent. 
Some landlords are charging fees in excess of 200 the first day the tenant is late and $20 per day thereafter. Some tenants have paid their rent but owe more in late fees and are facing eviction due to being unable to pay their late fees. Please vote to support this ordinance and stay in touch with your family resource centers and housing authorities to ensure that they have what they need to enact this ordinance successfully. Um, this ordinance does not ban outright late fees. It bans any late fees that have to do with COVID um, hardships. And you have to prove that you have either been laid off or that you have had COVID and thus were unable to work. It's really a very modest little ordinance and it will prevent a lot of people from becoming evicted by the end of October. If we do nothing, then it'll be by the end of November. And then, <laughs> you know, we're just talking about keeping people off the streets, keeping people in their homes so that we, they have a chance to get back on their feet. That's what this ordinance is about. And I say that if we should do that, but not on the backs of the, the landlords. I mean, why, why don't we, I mean, it's, it's not fair to put it all on them. Dr. Waters? Yeah, I just, um, I wasn't suggesting that we not proceed, Polly. I was suggesting that uh, as we move forward, we'll have more information from whatever the governor does before we would, before this would be before us for a second reading. And in the meantime, we could, we could benefit from the analysis of unintended consequences that Karen and or, you know, others on her crew could do and, and inform this. So I, I, I favor moving forward, actually, with something. I, I would just observing that that we're going to learn a lot more before we get to a second reading at the end of October on this. So, All right, Councilmember Council Member Hidalgo Ferry, then Councilmember Peck. So a couple of things. So one of the things, and yes, I agree with um, Council Member Waters in, you know, we will be collecting data and we will be looking at these pieces as we move forward. The other piece is, so when we have a landlord who is struggling to pay off their, to pay their mortgage, make their mortgage payment because of a tenant who's fallen behind, would they be able to apply for any of the, would the CARES funding piece be able to apply for them? I think what we would want is, is the landlord to connect the tenant with us Okay. So that they could get the CARES funding that we have available. So okay. they, we would then in turn pay the landlord. So can there be some, a piece, a component to this, either in this ordinance or as something gets pushed out in communications that is tied to this ordinance that kind of stipulates a steps in the procedure? So if we, okay, so you hit this point before charging a late fee or going that route, you know, contact um, Susan Spaulding or contact, you know, what are, what are people's landlords and tenant um, options and have that in language as well, where it's tied to this ordinance. So it's seen as a group. So they're not looking in two different places. I think oftentimes when people are strapped or they're in crisis mode, being able to seek out resources in di but in different places. So if there's a way that we could have all this together streamlined, I think when we're dealing with people in crisis or financial crisis, to have something streamlined would be, in my opinion, would be helpful. But is that doable? Um, so Eugene will have to talk about the construction of the ordinance and, and how we could do that. But what I could say is I think in terms of streamlining the connection points, we can do that because um, we already have segments on our website. So there are multiple ways for people to get assistance on housing. The county has housing dollars, we have housing dollars. And so I think, can we streamline to go, here's where you go? Um, the answer to that question is yes. How that comes into the construction of the ordinance, we'll have to talk with Eugene and, and look at it because it, it may be something as before you can, uh, before this occurs, the tenant has to have gone through A, B, and C. I think that's what I hear you saying. If that's the direction of council, 
we can certainly look at it before we bring that back to council for first reading, if that's your direction. You know, and, and Mayor, if I can add, um, and we, we included that in the, uh, the council communication. So some of the initial recommendations from the task force is exactly what uh, council member Adago Faring is talking about. So, um, you know, so making sure that, that when renters are behind, that there is a, you know, that landlords do connect the, the renters with the assistance that is available, that they're, so they really are outlining um, some other options um, in terms of communications, what um, other sources that, um, you know, that landlords can apply for. So I think that's part of their outline of, of, of the recommendations. And, you know, I think what Susan Spaulding would say is that, that um, property owners and, and renters in, in Longmont are doing a, a great job of working together. Our, our mediators um, on our city team, as well as the city of Boulder team, they are really spreading out throughout the entire county to help resolve situations for both the property that benefit really the property owners and, and the tenders. We wanna keep people housed. And, um, and I think um, I, I just need to mention that they are really doing a great job and both our property owners and our renters are working together with our mediation teams to try to weather this storm and keep people housed and link folks to resources. I don't know how, again, that gets constructed in an ordinance, but, um, but Eugene can uh, help us with that, I guess. But. I, and I think it's really important to note too, that as you go through the process and it comes to surface that the reason why the tenant is behind has nothing to do with COVID, they will be charged a late fee. So, you know, you have these bad players on both sides. I mean, I rent a home. I love the per the homeowner who we work really well together and you know my husband's a plumber so it's we, we have a, a good open relationship between landlord tenant. So and I know I hear that happen often but I also hear that that's not happening and what we can do to really ensure that people are not because of covid getting kicked out to the streets. So uh councilor Peck so thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, so Susie, our Councilwoman Hidalgo Ferry, you, you put in a better conversation basically of what I was saying. Even though we have that communication out there, we do have bad players on both sides. And if both players know what to do, then perhaps it wouldn't become such a, a, a an anxiety point for both. If, if the, if the property owner can direct the tenant, if they know about this funding, and that, that's what I was getting at. Make sure that the property owners, the management companies know that before they go to the nth degree of uh, late fees or whatever, to direct that resident to Susan Spalding or whatever website we need to go. I'm just, I was just talking about the communication um, because from the emails and the phone calls that we've got, those property owners don't know about that. They're, they're very concerned that they're going, I don't want them to lose money. And uh, if their tenant can pay the mortgage through the city, they need to know that so they can direct their tenant. That's all I was getting at. And Mayor Bagley, I would agree with you on some of your points. If in fact that late fee was the same everywhere, but to charge a late fee and then interest on top of a late fee just puts everybody behind. And thinking of the city, I don't want these people on the streets because we haven't figured out how to work together. So. And, and I guess what I'm saying is there's people, in, people have entered into contracts, landlords with banks, tenants with landlords, and putting it on the landlord to say, well, now you're responsible to make sure that people don't, don't go to the streets. I took, no. I live, I live in Prospect. Um, it's a very left leaning neighborhood and, uh, they're all million dollar homes. Why don't we, uh, why don't we take up a collection down here and start, uh, helping people pay their rent, but putting it on a landlord who we have no idea. I mean, uh, council member Doggo Faring, she just said she rents a home. I think Marsha Martin rents a couple homes. 
Um, those aren't the ones I'm thinking about. What happens if you have an apartment building with 400 units? I mean, who's going to police? I mean, it sounds good to say, well, it has to be coronavirus induced, but who's the police to determine whether or not it was coronavirus induced? Is there a city panel? Is there, I mean, what we're talking about is it's not going to work. And, and even Karen Roney said they've not taken the opportunity to think through the unintended consequences. So it sounds like a really generous idea, but again, what we're doing, do, yeah, let's just stick it on the landlords. They, they own property, they're rich, they can do it. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I just wanted to clarify a, a couple of details about the administration um, of these care funds that um, maybe is buried in there somewhere. I didn't catch it, but um, first of all, if uh, a tenant applies for care funding, the funding that they're granted is paid directly to the landlord, right? So there's no opportunity for the fund, for the grant to grow astray, the rental assistance to go astray. That's the way I would, that's the way I want to construct it. So you can have the accountability you need. So right. you don't get the money clawed back, correct? Yeah, and so and so then the, the other question is is what is reimbursable through these through this funding? Is it rents only or is it tenant debt to the landlord? Um, in other words, can will the cares will the cares money pay for pay for the relate fee? You know, that's a good question. I'll have to, I'll have to work with Peter on that one because um, if you remember when we talked about it, you can't, I mean, they're, so the city, we can't use it as a, rev, as a revenue replacement fund. And, and so that's right. a nuance we're going to have to track down with Dola because it could be, it very well could be that we could only use it for rent. We couldn't use it for late fees. Um, but we'll need yeah. to track that question well, down. And, and it, I mean, the answer to that question also informs what we would do about an ordinance uh, like this. Um, you know, if we know that the landlord is going to get uh, at least the base rent, then forgiving a late fee is a little different than if the landlord could go on forever and get nothing from any tenant. Um, and the other thing that, um, I wanted to ask was uh, about unintended consequences. There already are some in that uh, uh, landlords are already increasing security deposits for new tenants, um, you know, so uh, which is another good way to keep people from getting into housing. If you now have to have two months rent and a security deposit, um, that's really nearly unattainable. Um, so it would really, the, it's a better solution to make sure that landlords feel secure um, than it is to make them less secure. That's something to consider. All right, so what do you need from us, Karen? Well, we, we could use some direction, direction. On, uh, <laughs> on whether you want us to bring forth this ordinance for first reading, like it is, modify it, don't do it at all, or something else. So it's, it's we could use some direction. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, Councilmember Christensen, please turn on your microphone. Sorry, I move that we move forward with it. All right. I have a second. All right. Uh, Go ahead, Councilmember Peck. What? You can I either second it or make a no mo your own motion. Well, I just uh, wanted an amendment to the uh, motion that we put in the task force part that if, if the task force comes up with a solution on late fees or recommendation on let fee, late fees that we take that into account for this ordinance as well. If in, did I you would, say, I would accept that amendment. Would we, did you say Karen or Harold that you thought this would come back on a second reading 
after the task force has made their recommendations? If the task force stays on schedule, then the second reading will fall after the task force recommendations come out. So I think we should say we would follow the task force recommendations on late fees, whatever that is. All right, there's a, there's a motion on the table. Uh, I don't see any more uh, discussion or debate. So let's go ahead and vote on it. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. 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 All right, raise your hand if you said aye. All right, so the motion carries four to three. So we'll proceed with that. And that was with Councilmember Christensen, Councilmember Waters, Councilmember Dio Berry, and Councilmember Peck voting in favor. All right, great. All right, let's go on to Mayor and Council comments. Anyone? Councilmember, uh, Councilmember Christensen. I just like everybody to remember um, that the opening for the Day of the Dead is at the museum is October 1st. And it's um, a wonderful time for everybody around the world to remember all the people who've gone before them. Thanks. All right, Councilor Martin. Yes, I would actually like everyone to know that uh, the League of Women Voters has done a really fine job of deeply researching the issues on uh, the Colorado ballot this year, all the way down to, um, to municipal level uh, issues. And uh, that their voter guide goes online live uh, at 411 vote org uh, on October 2nd, which gives you a week and a half, a good 10 days to really study the ballot before you have to fill it in and still vote really, really early. Um, that, you know, they're a nonpartisan organization. They did wonderful research and they endorsed both of Longmont's ballot questions. So everybody go to 411 vote and uh, get that get that ballot in early. All right, thanks, Councilmember Martin. All right, Harold, you got anything? No comments, Mayor Council. Eugene. No comments, Mayor. All right, Councilmember Peck, we have a motion to adjourn, please. I move to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries unanimously. All right. See you next week, guys. Thanks. Bye.